Any, any questions that we might be able to answer? Yes. What's your strategy for presenting this bill, and, and what kind of impact do you think it might have? Well, we've have? begun that strategy today, and I want to give at least a little bit of, of good news within this uh, gloomy prognosis uh, and uh, series of developments. And that is that I have the belief, I feel very strongly, that the concept of corporate welfare today is known by a heck of a lot more Americans than was the case a year ago. And I think that the Progressive Caucus, as a matter of fact, deserves some of that credit. Uh, the more the American people hear about the excesses in the Gingrich proposals which benefit the wealthy and the largest corporations, the harder it is for ordinary people to accept the need to cut back on Medicare, Medicaid fuel assistance. So I think what we are doing today from a political point of view is precisely the right thing. And I think, I know in the state of Vermont, all over the state, I think all over the country, people are saying, give me a break. you got to be kidding. They're not going to raise taxes on the working poor to lower taxes on the largest, most profitable corporations. you got to be kidding. And I think the more that we can contrast the tax breaks for the rich and the powerful with the horrendous cuts that are taking place for the elderly, for the kids, for the middle class, and for working people, the more people are going to see the fraudulent nature of the entire Republican package. So we're going to take the word out, and I know all of us have already done that. We've already been throughout our districts talking about it. And I must tell you very, very honestly that all over the state of Vermont, and I'm sure all over America, people are rising up in arms against corporate welfare. It is impossible. It is impossible for Gingrich or anybody to defend doing away with taxes for the largest, most profitable corporations in America, and then cutting back on fuel assistance for senior citizens who are in desperate need of surviving in a cold winter. Nobody from a moral point of view, nobody who has any sense of social justice can defend it. They can't. And in fact, they don't even try to defend it. What they hope to do, as you all know, is to bring this thing forward as quickly as possible, uh, get it out of here as quickly as possible, use their friends in the, in the corporate media to hide what's going on, and then two weeks before the election, spend millions of dollars on 30-second ads and hope that they can uh, retain control of the House. On a practical level, uh, the, later this afternoon, I will be uh, appearing before the Rules Committee, asking the Rules Committee to make in order an amendment which would repeal from the Reconciliation Bill the provisions that they have put in there to repeal the alternative minimum tax. This is an issue that needs uh, discussion based upon its own merits. <clears throat> And I think that uh, the, the American people deserve to understand what is in this reconciliation bill. It is, as you know, a very large, very complex, complicated measure which is going to have profound impacts on our society should it pass in the form that it is being presented to the House beginning this afternoon. So we're going to uh, make, make uh, every effort to delete from this bill and have a specific separate vote uh, on the alternative minimum tax when this bill comes before the full House later today and tomorrow. Mr. Sanders, would you be able to offer your uh, seven-year budget as a substitute? Why, why is that? If it's because the number of, all, all, uh, of amendments will be limited. I, as I understand it, there will be one uh, alternative, which will be the conservative Democrat alternative. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. In other words, despite all the talks about the open rule, what we are saying is, yeah, we are going to balance the budget. We can balance the budget in seven years. And guess what? We don't have to cut Medicare, Medicaid, fuel assistance education and student loans. Will we be given a chance to debate that issue before the American people? No, we will not. Do you see supporting the coalition plan then? Do I personally? Or any of you? No. I will not, no. All right. I will not support it. Sanders, on this chart that talks about uh, individual members uh, voting for personal and corporate tax cuts for themselves, I know you didn't generate this, but is this saying that only Republicans are voting for these kind of tax cuts? No, I think what you the best of my knowledge, what that indicates that those who, in fact, will be the major recipients, there will be Democrats who will also be recipients who are voting for it. Is there any indication that, that your efforts about corporate welfare has had any real impact on either the president, which who's, who also talks about cutting a big chunk out of Medicare, or, or you've got this conservative Democratic alternative, which, I mean, is, it sounds as if you're, uh, it sounds as if, well, is there any impact? Yes, I think there has been. I mean, minimal. Minimal. Uh, John Kasich, as you know, who's the Republican chairman of the Budget Committee, uses the phrase corporate welfare uh, quite often. 
Uh, we did have some success in lowering the amount of public money that will go into uh, OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Uh, we had some success in getting past the House and the Senate the uh, corporate welfare that went to the CEOs and the executives of Lockheed Martin, who wanted $31 million from the Pentagon for laying off 19,000 American workers in their merger. And I was very surprised, having offered that amendment, at how quickly both the Republican and Democratic leadership accepted it. So I think that when you press these guys, and the reason they don't want this amendment on the floor is, you know what? They don't want to defend it. They are embarrassed. So to answer your question, the concept of the injustice of corporate welfare is seeping down. You find even Republicans talking about it. But as Major Owens indicated, they are just touching it a little bit. And for every inch that they touch it, they're giving a foot in more welfare uh, to the wealthy and, and the big corporations. And what about the president? Is the president, president getting the message? No, in my view, the president has not been anywhere near as strong as he should be on this issue. He should be dealing with these issues and telling the American people, you don't have to slash Medicare, Medicaid, and student loans. Has he been doing that? No. When one talks to him privately, yes, he says, I am concerned, I'm sympathetic to the effort. Publicly, we have not been hearing enough uh, from him on this issue. In my view, you guys agree with that? Or? Any Democrats? <laughs> Coming out of is there Easy president? for me to attack the president. <laughs> no, I, um... It would be a fairer test to the president if uh, the Republicans weren't such hypocrites. But remember, they made a big deal of passing the line item veto, which would obviously be a key tool in dealing with this bill. And yet somehow they haven't managed to appoint conferees in the last eight months since they got headlines for passing the line item veto. Most of my constituents think that we adopted a line item veto the way the Republicans touted it. But they very cynically are withholding it from this president so that he couldn't go in and take out some of the most egregious things here. He has not been as forthright on this. Most Democrats aren't forthright on this. You're talking about all the money and power in America and all the money and power in politics. I know I'm in the middle of the Senate race. It's all on the other side. So, uh, you know, when you take on these people, there are consequences. But at least you sleep at night. I want to add, I think as far as uh, Puerto Rico, too, the president has taken a stand. And I think it was the first, it was the first one to modify the, the 936 by including <clears throat> the tax credit uh, on, based on wages and, and payroll. So that was back in 1993. And he has been uh, supportive. But as, as uh, Peter says, the, uh, the amount of money that is out there, the amount of uh, economic influence that these companies represent are just like, incredible. I was a sole voice in Puerto Rico against all these companies. We have two members of the Progressive Caucus who were defending the, the 936, the one from Chicago and one from New York, two Puerto Ricans, <laughs> were defending this the Section 936. They went to the president to ask him to restore the tax credit based on the, on the income. Uh, from Gutierrez from uh, Chicago and Nidia Velasquez from New York. So, and you're going to, the companies that save over $4 billion a year in taxes, there's a lot of money out there for, uh, for lobbying and a lot of money for paying into campaigns and PACs. They have a, they have a, a, a Puerto Rico Prusa, they call it here, is, is an organization uh, maintained by these companies here in Washington to lobby and, to, and they, they, it, take ads in the newspaper. When I ran, I ran, they had ads against me all over the, all over the place, and in every single radio station, in every single town in Puerto Rico, I'm, that I was attempting against the jobs of the Puerto Ricans. So it's not easy to tackle all this power and this influence, and I've taken it on myself. Now i got more and more people. Now the governor's also on my side, and, and uh, many more people are on my side now in Puerto Rico. Even some of the companies have decided that they're, they opted now for the wage tax credit, and they're putting ads in the paper saying that this is a good option. So it, I think the president has been there, at least in, in this issue. And, and